there. Welcome to another edition of Talk Stocks. I'm your host, Keir Reynolds, and today we're lucky enough to have Amrit Maharaj, COO of Coho Collective Kitchens, uh, which trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the ticker Coho, C-O-H-O. Hey, Amrit, how you doing today? Doing very well, Keir. How are you? Hey, I'm great, thanks. Uh, really excited to have uh, been following your company for a la uh, last little while, and it seems like hey, you guys are making some really interesting moves. I've had some good personal success kind of in the food space and uh, know, know it quite well, and uh, really intrigued to sort of learn a bit more about what you guys have going on today. Um, maybe before we jump into the business and do a deep dive on that with you, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about who you are. What's your background for those of us that don't know you? I appreciate that, and I'll try and keep this short because I could go on and on about that part of my life as well. So, Amrit Maharaj is one of the co-founders. My other co-founder is Andrew Barnes. Him and I have known each other for about 20 years. This business started as a creative outlet for us to give back to the community that has done so well for us. I come from real estate development, our family business. My father started for over 40 years, so I come from the hustle and bustle and grind of the Vancouver real estate market, which has taught us very well, but also served the kitchens very well because I've been able to manage the growth side from a very technical aspect. Plus, I've done some other startups along the way. Uh, one is currently still running. It's Western Canada's largest rehearsal spaces for musicians, and it's also a shared space. So it lended well to the shared kitchen space that eventually evolved out of the shared music space. So a love and passion for giving back to the community combined with healthy revenues and a strong strong profit margin have always driven me to to, to success and, and led us to this business. So enjoying the ride. How, how's the public market side of this business compared to some of your other ventures? It's an interesting one. It's definitely been a ride over the last few years and everybody's been on the same one. So it's a lot of learning and it's got us a lot of grit. We've been very fortunate that we've had very strong supporters and our shareholders and in the public market side of things. So we're very proud of where we've gotten to, but it's been a lot of learning. Like if you can survive these times, you can get through anything. We're very proud to be getting out of it with a lot of momentum. Yeah, for sure. It's been probably one of the harder times I've seen to be uh, a small publicly traded company, a micro cap. Uh, but those that are, uh, you, you know, using the hard times to develop that grit, as you say, and, and also improve the fundamentals are now starting to see that sort of pay off um, totally. a number of companies that I own that have improving quarter over quarter sort of fundamentals um, are performing, you know, a lot of them are performing very well, 52 week highs, and a number of them keep getting acquired, which, uh, yeah. uh, which is an interesting, uh, interesting thing to sort of have, uh, have happen. Um, well, so anyways, the there, opportunity time to, yeah, opportunity time to get to know you guys and uh, glad that uh, you're, uh, you're, you know, focused on, uh, on really sort of getting through, getting through it and, and also take an opportunity to learn. Um, so you mentioned you're a co-founder of it with Andrew. Uh, you also have a pretty varied background, uh, like you indicated, and one that uh, lends itself well. You guys need to be able to, um, you know, uh, deal on the real estate, on the space side. So you bring that to the table. I also noticed uh, in reading up, uh, you've been awarded for your philanthropic uh, contributions to BC and the communities. Uh, maybe you could uh, speak a little bit about that work. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate the, the sentiment there. It, it's been a big part of my life. I've had very good mentors and my parents who always taught us about giving back. They're immigrants to this country and they're very proud of what they've been able to build here because of what Canada's been able to provide in our own backyard. So as we grew up, we've always been surrounded by my parents giving back and it was a very strong influence. So as we grew older, we wanted to make sure that we carried that legacy on and we carry it in business, we carry it in personal. So wherever we go, we're trying to make sure that we're impacting the communities on different levels. And it's always been an enjoyment part of mine as well. It gives, gives good balance to life. It teaches you perspective and also gives you good ideas on how to actually help other people through the different charity work that we do. So it's been it's been a really fun part of my, my adult life, but also just comes from a, the childhood of being surrounded by people that always gave back. So it's been a really good influence for me. Hey, well, that's excellent. Uh, uh, congratulations on that. It's uh, very meaningful work. And it's only getting much more important in uh, in the sort of challenging world that we live in. So uh, so all the props to you there. Thank um, you. Maybe just turning back to Coho a little bit uh, as the chief operating officer, uh, would you sort of walk us through what a typical day looks like and what sort of responsibilities you have with the business? 
I think that's a great question because there's no typical day and that's why we love this business. Being part of a startup, growing a startup, there's nothing that's ever scheduled that ever, or sorry, your days are scheduled, but sometimes they just go off track and that's the beauty of it. And my days are about the growth and expansion of the business while making sure that the insides are turning at the right rate. The staff are running lean, but they're also running as fast as hard as they can. And then looking outwards to meet with investors and properly channel the, the funds that we're bringing in from our shareholders to Accurate Avenue. So my days are super varied, very enjoyable, and I get to meet lots of different background people. We get to get out in the community, get to spread the message, spread the gospel, what Coho is. At the same time, the internal teams that are running the business, running the engines, are making sure that they're running at full capacity, have what they need, have the guidance, have the mentorship, have the decisions made to actually push it in the right direction and grow with stability, but also with speed. So thankfully, these days are all over the place, but in a focused manner that I'm able to do so many different things for this business, but also make sure that it's running at the capacity that it needs to. Excellent. And uh, just, we're going to change gears a little bit and we'll yeah. talk a bit about the restaurant sector and sort of the, the food and beverage and restaurant sector sort of as a whole. Uh, but before we dive into that, could, for those that are unfamiliar with Coho, could you give a little like pitch, like what the company is? It's got a couple of divisions right now. Could you just give a brief overview? Uh, on what Coho is all about? Absolutely, and you're right. There is two divisions. One is the shared kitchen space. So anybody unfamiliar with that term, there are other terms for it. Ghost kitchens, dark kitchens, commissary kitchens. What we're doing is providing space for food and beverage businesses to decrease their costs and increase their economies of scale so they can grow faster, bigger, smarter, faster, whatever they need, we're providing in that space. The other division of Coho is the recent, recent acquisition we did called Purebred Bakery. And they're a seven location bakery that has a huge cult following in BC alone and is now part of our growth map to go across North America. So we're now combining two businesses together. But in 2018, we started with Coho, the shared kitchen space, and it's now evolved into the shared kitchen space plus the bakery space that we've acquired. Yeah, I've, I've been here one in Whistler a few times. Amazing. Uh, great, great, uh, <laughs> Great place, uh, so uh, I'm very highly recommended for sure. So what what a great uh, a great company, great brand to have uh, under the Coho umbrella. Uh, but you. maybe just uh, before we jump in and get a little bit more detailed on on the business units and the and the opportunity that is Coho, maybe we can talk a little bit about sort of the restaurant sector. Uh, obviously, we've been in a fairly high inflationary environment for the last few years. Yep. Uh, food has really sort of been one of the areas that continues to sort of be impacted. Um, you know, as somebody that's, um, you know, in a vertically integrated sort of food business, both from, you know, helping a young sort of startup, you know, brand all the way to having commercial uh, facilities, uh, you know, um, uh, where you're obviously, you know, uh, preparing meals and things for people. Um, what would be the biggest sort of challenges um, in, in this environment? And also, what would be some of the biggest opportunities because of the environment that we're in? Absolutely. So the challenges, like you're talking about, the inflationary costs are across the board, whether it's your raw materials for your actual food production, your packaging, gas to deliver, whatever products are going out the door. There's so much that's happening that's just causing such a fluctuation in restaurants' margins, which are already thin to begin with. So the ghost kitchen side has taken a hit when it comes to all these different factors hitting at the same time. We have the opportunity now to work with the partners that we have in place. Sodexo is one of them. We just recently did a news release on Sodexo Global being part of our ecosystem where we're partnering with their GPO branch, their group purchasing orders, where they have an immense amount of buying power, over $30 billion that they're purchasing every year. And we are now able to tap into that system. So these partners are strategic, but there are also ways that we can drive down costs through their backbone, through their discounts, through their ordering power. Rather than us going as one single entity, we go now as a group through their partnership. So it's been a very tough time for restaurants. Restaurants are seeing increases in lease rates and property taxes and everything that's happening in their bricks and mortar space. So for us, they turn to us to help decrease those costs, to increase their economies of scale. We break down those barriers so they can get in the door. Or if they want to shut down their actual bricks and mortar, they can keep their brand going, they can keep their revenue going by being in our space. So the model is shifting. COVID really amplified the ghost kitchen model by having no restaurants yeah. open, period. But once the restaurants reopened, now they had to deal with all sorts of government loans that need to be paid back. 
inflationary issues, rents going up. There's so many factors that are against them at this point. So now sure. is the opportunity to actually help them on a different level and on a different scale where they're coming to us with, okay, we have a solid brand. We want to keep it going, but we don't have the space that we have that we can afford. So how sure. do we mitigate that? So work with us on that and then get into our supply chain. Let us help you reduce your costs. Let us get to your pain points and have that opportunity addressed with us as our, as our reach increases they benefit. So it's a win-win on that side. We're just trying to make sure that they're aware of there is options rather than just shutting down your restaurant or turning it off completely. Yeah. Uh, I'm really interested to learn more in the ghost kitchen. I know when COVID was happening, I was actually living in downtown Vancouver and, you know, a lot of the restaurants kind of closed for in, um, like in, in on-premise sort, sort of dining and they all became sort of like takeout uh, delivery type businesses, they all became kind of quasi ghost kitchens, yeah. uh, where they didn't have to worry about patrons in the restaurant. Um, all the food being produced would be packed up and sort of like we'd get it at home, right? Yeah. Uh, but I imagine as things reopen, uh, that also creates a bit of a tricky business, not only if uh, it's unsustainable uh, to, to continue to pay based upon increase in, in lease rates, but also how do you deal with now having like on-premise uh, patrons that are looking for full service uh, where they're going to eat there as well as continuing on with sort of the takeout uh, sort of business. So I'm sure that um, um, I would imagine that you guys provide a bit of an avenue to uh, separate those two things. Um, we would, do. That, would, that, would that be one of the things that you guys do there? We definitely do. We provide that avenue to separate those things. We also provide that avenue for them to break into new markets without having that bricks and mortar expense right away. So rather than spending the money, a million dollars, two million dollars, restaurants are expensive to open to begin with. If you already have a strong name, you're trying to get your brand into a different segment, a different market in the lower mainland. We have kitchens all over BC at this point. If you're trying to get into Victoria, you can come to us as a, as a Vancouver brand have your ghost kitchen set up. People can now see you on their delivery apps like, oh, great. I love this restaurant in Vancouver. Now we can have it in Victoria. So these restaurants now have an avenue. You're right. Now dividing their time that they have their in-house seating. Restaurants don't make any money in the kitchens. They make everything in the upfront and the liquor sales where all the people are sitting. So they're realizing that they can do their take on delivery from our spaces, but they can also expand from our spaces. So it gives them two different avenues to be in our kitchens and still create healthy revenue streams without the risk. So I thought that, uh, uh, you know, purebred was an interesting pickup. One of the things I've sort of noticed, uh, you know, even with my own sort of uh, uh, food habits, food eating habits, uh, uh, is that uh, QSR and fast casual, um, you know, have, have tended to uh, get a bigger share, I, I think, of business um, in terms of number of consumers uh, that would go. So instead of like eating out at a full service restaurant for dinner, maybe we're shifting to a fast casual for lunch or for breakfast, things like that. Places where purebred, I, I'm sure, sort of thrive and and really, you know, are are you know, you got your legion of fans. Um, I think we're starting to see a bit of that kind of trickle down. We've obviously seen, you know, fast casual and QSR uh, brand groups, you know, south of the border, their stocks are 52 week high, all time high, um, per, and then we're starting to see a trickle into the micro caps, like uh, one called Happy Belly Food Group, which some of those that watch my channel know that uh, we're a big fan of done a number of videos. I see a little uh, uh, synergy and, uh, and, and, and you guys are a little similar. Uh, like you said, capital has been a bit hard to come by and only reserved for well-run groups. Do you sense that we're sort of in a bit of an upswing here and that maybe being a food publicly traded food company won't be like a four letter word uh, moving forward? <laughs> I love that description. Absolutely, yes. We are definitely an upswing and we're seeing it. We're seeing it from not only the volume that we're seeing in our stock and our trading, but also the interest in our business. People are understanding it now. And like we talked about earlier, the downturn in the market gave us time to focus on our fundamentals, the foundation of the business, growing it from the proper methods and not just growth at all costs, but growing it from solid revenue from the acquisitions and now scaling with that proper foundation in place. So working with the Happy Belly Food Group, we've got an amazing partnership with them right now in a strategic alliance. They're a great example of what happens when you focus on the fundamentals, have the right foundation, focus on growth and revenue, but making sure that it is sustainable. And they've taken countries across, or taken brands across the country and they've just signed new ones from Vancouver, like Yolks, which they'll be taking yeah. across Canada. And it's such a strong brand here. They see the opportunity. And when they came in to look at purebred, 
they saw that opportunity. They know that there's a missing segment in the market from where Purebred stands. And you're talk, you hit it around that, that QSR market is not letter, it's not gonna be a four letter word for much longer. It's now people are paying attention that this is something that really is needed. And the Purebred side of things, working with Happy Belly and their experience, their knowledge, their contacts, we don't have those missteps where people were doing before because they're growing at all costs because they had all this funding coming in the door. We've had to be strategic because funding has been tight. We've had to watch our dollars and cents. We've had to make sure that shareholder value is there. We've had to make sure that we respect all the money that's being brought in by the people that believe in us and using people, working with people like Happy Belly Food Group, they're a great example of using that money and then multiplying it in the right way. So really looking forward to growing the purebred brand with them, but making sure that we listen and learn and use what they've already done in the past to our full advantage to grow this business across Canada, across North America. Yeah, um, excellent. Well said. Um, so maybe we could, uh, let's uh, do a bit more of a deep dive right into sort of Coho and your two business sure. segments. You've got sort of, you've got, as you've indicated, you've got the two, you've got your, I'll call it ghost kitchen, uh, you know, Coho sort of brand of business. Um, and then you've got your purebred business. Um, how do you sort of see those two sort of uh, really complementing each other? I know we touched on a few points, but I'll let you sort of say it as someone who's uh, living and breathing it and, and directing traffic every day. Absolutely. And we love it. And the way they complement each other. So a little bit of background on purebred. They run a very healthy margin, almost 20 percent margin on their business. One of the reasons and the main driver behind that is they have essential production facilities. So all their goods are made out of one location and shipped daily, shipped fresh daily. So whether you're in Whistler, whether you're in Vancouver, the product is coming from one space that allows extreme cost control extreme uh, quality control. So, so many different factors that you can't do when you have it on site being made by individuals, it just tends to vary. So they've been right. able to control their cost through central production facilities. Coho is a central production facility. We provide production facilities for many different types of food and beverage businesses. So these businesses put together the purebred side and the Coho side. Coho has nine kitchens across BC. Purebred has seven locations across mostly the lower mainland at this point and see the sky highway as we combine the businesses now coho becomes that production facility for purebred as purebred needs to grow across canada we now have central production already in place for them so the scalability grows even faster with the two working together purebred now has all the opportunity whether you're in calgary or toronto or montreal to be these what i like love to call glorified art galleries because when you walk into a purebred it's indulgence overload they've got 75 to 80 pastries on display at one time and it just hits you like a like just this wall of amazement but the reason yeah. you're able to do that is because the central <laughs> production facility can just ship out daily and no baking equipment is needed on site so we just have a nice display a coffee machine and we've got a space open ready to go so the two businesses really do complement each other very well b2c on the purebred side and b2b on the coho side so true vertical integration very much so yes that's why we were very, very cool. excited about the acquisition huh very strategic uh makes yeah. some very good sense uh i hope you target some other uh, uh tasty food groups as well uh, man, it'd be nice to see another donut brand uh, make make donuts great again. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that's a good tagline. You should you should uh, trademark that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, I'm I, I'm not allowed to eat them anymore. I've had too many. But uh, uh, anyways, uh, maybe you can make them healthier. Uh, well. <laughs> so anyways, uh, you, we cut, uh, I was going to ask a little bit about you know sort of generally like bakeries and coffee shops are kind of tough businesses. You kind of mentioned sort of the the margins that purebred makes, and you know although twenty percent in most businesses would be considered fairly low, uh, that would be considered you know industry leading. Um, uh, so that's one way it's sort of differentiated, and and now with true vertical integration, I'm sure the overall sort of margin sort of carries up when you factor that they're uh, able to. Uh, prepare their goods in one of your facilities. Um, uh, is, is there any other way that um, purebred sort of differentiated, you know, just from the general sort of like coffee shop or bakery uh, that everybody sort of like would know in their in their local community? How, um, what, uh, I see that it's got, uh, you know, raving reviews. What are some of the reasons for that? Absolutely. It's a great combination. It's one of the reasons we love to acquire this business. And we've been very, very fortunate to have that under our belt now that 
they, when we were acquiring their business, KPMG did a sentiment analysis for us because we wanted to make sure that this wasn't just our own judgment. We wanted to see what was happening in the public reaction. So they went through all the magazine reviews, they went through all the Google ratings and everything that was available online, all the articles, and they found that they were industry leading in every single category, whether it was customer service, whether it was location, whether it was selection of goods, whether it was coffee, whether whatever it was, they led in the category. And this is against very strong competitors in the marketplace. So we started diving deeper into that. And there's just this great culture that they have. When you walk in, you feel like it's your grandmother's house. And the grandmother that always makes you say, oh, that always says, you look thin, you should eat. This is an indulgent bakery. This is something that is missing in the segment across the marketplace where if you're having a bad day, you go get a treat and you reward yourself. If you're having a good day, you go in, you bring a box to a party and people love you when they see that little blue box, little blue box the other blue box, not the Tiffany one. This is the purebred blue box. So yeah, yeah. it really creates that atmosphere of want and indulgence that we're trying to focus on because it is missing in the sec it is missing in the marketplace. This is why purebred has been really successful and in fitting into a place that is quite noisy. Like there's a lot of bakeries out there. There's a lot of coffee shops out there, but the segment that they've really hit on is indulgence. It is no apologies about it, but they've got great revenue. They've got great margins. They've got great customer service. All these things tie in together. They've had 15 years in existence at this point. And they've really refined all their processes. So when we came in, we saw that there was a very strong training process, coffee process, everything on the accounting side, the business processes was in place for us to grow and expand on, but for us to understand at the same time. So we've been very fortunate to learn that this is something that is missing across North America, that we're able to fill that gap for, that missing indulgent market that we can scale. But when you walk in, it feels like your community bakery. It's not a QSR in the traditional sense of it's a cookie cutter model that looks the same everywhere you go and it's just a sterile place where you're in and out. This is something that you want to be at, you want to partake in. Our Instagram followers are huge. The time, the amount of um, non-direct marketing that we do that other people are posting for us is massive. So that cult-like following, if you've ever been to Whistler, like here was talking about, at 7.50, there's a lineup. We open at 8 a.m. There's a lineup before that place even opens in Whistler on a weekday. It's this yeah. amazing indulgence that's missing that people love and they want to be a part of and they want to have, whether it's beginning of the day, middle of the day, end of their day. So we just love the business that's been built by the former owners, Mark and Paul Lamming. We're very grateful that they've entrusted us with their legacy, but now it's our opportunity to grow this segment across the across the country and across North America. So uh, we're into 2024. What sort of plans uh, you know, do you have in place for both uh, sides of your division that you're able to speak on. Uh, you know, do you have any sort of growth plans for, for this year? Is it uh, to, you know, I know that you recently completed the acquisition of Purebred, so I'd imagine there's a integration that needed to be done and really understanding what you've sort of acquired. But what does 2024 look like in terms of uh, growth and expansion? Absolutely. It's super exciting for us. The growth and expansion on both sides are underway already. So from the Coho side, the share kitchen side, we're underway of construction of Canada's largest shared kitchen space, the ghost kitchen space. It's 26,000 square feet, and that should be opening Q3, Q4 of this year. And it's gonna be a statement piece. That is gonna be an amazing place for all different types of food and beverage businesses to be in, but also a purebred. On the purebred side, we've already signed a few leases for this year and continue to look for more locations because like I was talking about, they already have a centralized production facility. So seven locations are already being fed out of that one production space and there's still capacity to add more. So all we're looking for is a former cafe or a former bakery or a former Starbucks, because Starbucks has changed their model and they've yeah. left some really good locations open for us. We took over the YVR you spot. One, didn't you? Didn't we you did. we took over one, didn't you? We've actually snagged two. We took over YVR, we took over right. Squamish from, from Starbucks and it's been amazing for us. YVR is just hitting its stride really fast. So there's so much opportunity out there. And because Again, that central production facility, when we look at a bakery or a cafe to take over, it only takes two to three months to flip it. And each one of those locations generates over $2 million in revenue. Wow. The cost side of it, it only costs two hundred to 300000 to flip one of those old locations into a purebred. Again, because it's an art gallery. It's a display space that allows right. people to come in and indulge. It's not a production space. So we keep the cost low. We keep the time to open quick. And then we can have a profitable business open within three months and then having two million of revenue under our belt. So really focusing on that growth and expansion of purebred. The coho side is chugging along really well. That building is going underway. It's 26,000 square feet. It's a massive, massive endeavor on that side. While that's happening, 
keep building the purebred brand, keep building more and more locations, keep building that infrastructure, keep that integration going, and start having more verticals being uh, tapped, whether it's wholesale, whether it's retail, all that type of thing that purebred hasn't quite gotten into yet. We're pushing for that this year. In terms of any like specifics, do you have any specific numbers out there in terms of like number of new locations that you'd be expanding um, uh, for 2024? So it yep. sounds like you've got your expansion plan with Coho, 26,000 square foot largest ghost kitchen in Canada. Um, so yep. that sounds like one there. Um, are there others with Coho? And then what is uh, purebred looking like in terms of um, uh, the, the total number of uh, new locations that somebody could hope for in 2024? Currently in 2024, we're looking at three locations right now for the purebred side of things, but we are intentionally going out and signing more leases and looking to expand on that. By 2026, we're aiming to have 30 purebreds across Canada at a minimum. There's a very healthy map of our trajectory to grow but it's just getting that momentum going now. So this year, three to sure. four plus whatever we can find on the marketplace that is the right space, the right fit, the right community, and the right purpose for us to actually be there rather than just trying to open for opening sake. We want to make sure that it's systematic. That's why working with people like Happy Belly to guide us and make sure that we're doing it in the right spots and maybe addressing spots that we're not aware of. So the, the purebred side of things, the leases that we have in place, the two or three leases right now, and then growing from there to three, four, or five, or six this year, and then beyond that to 30 locations by 2026, end of that year. And then Coho, same thing. As we find opportunities for purebred, we can expand into Calgary and Toronto and grow the, the Coho brand behind it to provide that centralized, centralized production facility and have the ghost kitchens as that great pairing, as that great vertical integration between the two of them. So definitely looking forward to the growth on the purebred side and the Coho side together. But the speed and the, the ease that we can do the purebred openings. We're just searching constantly for new and new spaces. And it's fun having that brand because people are coming to us with what they want to see in their community. So purebred is the hot commodity in it right now. And are you are these all corporately owned stores or do you offer purebred as a franchising model? Are you looking at potentially franchising in the future? Maybe you could just talk to me a bit about that. Absolutely. Right now, 100% corporate. And for the next few years, yes, absolutely. And this is where Happy Belly is a great asset to us. They've franchised, they've run corporate, they know both sides of the equation, and they are working with us on strategy for that to move forward. What we're doing right now with them is intentionally building a franchisable model in quotation marks, but keeping it corporate. So something that is easily replicated, using their resources and helping them understand what our business is so they can help us guide on how do we open these faster and make sure that they're congruent with the original concept and the original ideas and then have them as a space that we can move them faster with, but keep it corporately owned. So franchise right. model is great because it enables, enables you to replicate fast with different types of ownership. For us, we'll have that same model, but keep it corporate for now. And as we expand into new territories, evaluate if franchising is the right model for us, whether it's Ontario or to the United States. We'll see if there's partners that can help us amplify faster with the same amount of care and integrity that we currently have. So it's a, it's a model that will make sure that it's there. And then when we need to activate it, we will. Or if we keep it corporate, it's really solid revenue with very good margins that we can always keep under our own umbrella. In terms of uh, the typical ghost kitchen setup, um, what types of uh, food, what types of equipment do you have in them or what type of food can be produced? Is it going to be like uh, uh, baked goods? Is it going to be like salads? Is it going to be, uh, is it going, is it going to be like any confectionery type stuff? Uh, what sort of capability do some of these ghost kitchens have? The ghost kitchens are right across the board. So whatever type of food, whatever type of background or ethnicity or, or specialty type of food it is, we have the equipment for it. And if we don't, we bring it in for the client or the consumer that's actually going to be operating out of the space. So again, very fortunate that our teams are so strong that whatever it is, we have somebody that understands that marketplace. So whether you're making Indian food or Chinese food or specialty, like you're talking about pastries or whatever it is within that space, we provide it. So we do have some of the most state-of-the-art facilities across Canada or in Canada across BC right now at this point as we go across Canada as we're moving in there. But we're able to make sure that whatever the client needs to use our space properly and most efficiently, we do have. And if they're growing their business within our space, making sure that we see what their directory is and provide that equipment to allow that growth as well. So very fortunate that we've had very good teammates on our side right now that have helped us plan that growth and make sure that we have the equipment we need for now, but also for the future. Well, it sounds really uh, interesting for sure. Um, let's switch gears again 
maybe we could talk cap table and financial. Yep, maybe totally. you could break down, uh, give us a little overview on on sort of Coho's cap table. Sure. Uh, so for the far this capital structure goes, we went public in June of 2022. There's 116 million shares out there right now. About 85 million are free trading. So the cap table is very strong. Uh, we've got myself and my business partner, um, Andrew, co-founders. We're about 22% of that. And then very tightly held from some of the initial investors beyond that side of it. Um, but about 500,000 cash on hand for that cap table as well. Excellent. And what were the terms of the last couple of financings uh, uh, that you've done? Uh, the, the most recent, so we'll go chronologically, chronologically backwards. Uh, the most recent was the acquisition of Purebred. So we raised about 4.5 million on a life exemption from right. the TSX um, for the, the actual purchase of of Purebred. And then prior to that, in May, we did a 1.65 million convertible note, and the terms on that were an 8% rate, which right now is looking very good. Uh, at a 15 cent conversion price. So very fortunate again, that was from one of our initial investors that uh, helped provide that capital for us. And uh, you've mentioned a bit about a, a insider uh, holdings. So that's nice to see over 20%. Are there any strategic investors that you're able to talk about? We, we can. Um, there is a large family office here in BC that has very Large, expanded ownership around many different platforms, and they are a very strategic partner of ours. If you dive deep into some of our news releases, they are there. They're a very quiet family, but they also have significant holdings that are in the food and beverage space, but also in the sports and entertainment space, the farming space, and uh, real estate development space. So the strategic alliance there is that they're able to provide us a backbone and a platform for us to expand quickly, but also introductions and connections to get into different marketplaces through all their different holdings. So. Very fortunate that we've had strong supporters from almost the get-go of this business and creating the strategic alliance and these partnerships with this family office and then other key investors that have helped us grow into marketplaces faster. And then even people like Happy Belly were introduced through these types of partnerships. So creating a brand that's strong, that people want to help grow, that want to see their investment and want to see longevity in it and want to see the shareholder value go up. They're providing us with the avenues what we need, whether it's the key personnel, the board members that we have on site right now, in place right now that have been very good and two new ones that have just joined. One is uh, Maria, the CTO of EA Sports, uh, overseeing 30 different offices, chief technical officer there. That's a huge one for us growing our technical expertise on the coho and the purebred side, having our apps in place and the data management. And the other one is the ex-CEO of Freshie, Dan Haroon, also a yeah. VP of Walmart Canada. So having these people in place, having those strategic investors, we now really got that foundation set where we can grow and expand and have it with confidence and making sure that we're not guessing. We know people, we work with people that understand these markets so we can really grow this business together. So if you were mentioning before, you got seven purebreds uh, that you own, like their, their own uh, majority by, uh, by the Pubco, yeah. Um, you were saying they sort of do about gross sort of 2 million in, in sort of annual sales per location. Is that correct? Yeah. So our trailing 12 months, we're just under 11 million for that right now because um, YBR was just opening sure. at that point. So now that's just getting traction at this point. And then Coho is about 4 million. So there's about a $15 million entity under the, the two brands together right now at the tra and trailing 12 a, months. And you have a market cap of what, around 20? Am I... Uh, depends what day it is, but yeah, 17 to 20 ish, depending on the fluctuation in the market right now. So yes, we're, we feel that we're undervalued and we're going to prove it to the market that we are a very good buy right now. We can push this brand to where it needs to get to, and then show you that companies like Starbucks, they've got a three times revenue market cap right now. So we want to be in that same echelon as fast as possible. Yeah, very, very cool. Uh, I certainly am a big fan of the dual pronged approach of, uh, first build it corporate. Make sure you really own the brand, nurture the brand, yeah. don't have anybody else screw up the brand, um, and, then, and really uh, build value into that brand, uh, like like what is being done with Purebred, with you know all of those great you know reviews and and uh, obviously getting you know your unit sales are impressive per location, uh, cost to open are impressive. Uh, I'm, you know, having a centralized production facility, so you know it's almost like going to a Starbucks that that that. You know, that muffin that you're getting is going to be the same no matter the location. So exactly. uh, I'm a big fan of sort of building it initially that way before, um, you know, entertaining or looking at a franchise. 
Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, um, great, great. Uh, yeah, it definitely seems like it's undervalued compared to some of the other opportunities out there. Yeah. Um, uh, why don't we sort of wrap up? We've spent about 35 minutes here. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and walking us through it in some detail. Um, what does sort of the next six months look like in terms of like some news flow that investors could anticipate? Again, I'm Absolutely. looking for anything like specific or <laughs> forward looking that uh, you're not yeah. allowed to talk about. Just what general sorts of things should we be expecting? Uh, and we're very excited. Of course, we're not going to say anything we shouldn't, but there's Q3s are coming out next week. So that's exciting for us. And that's just part of the regulatory process. But it's going to show the significant growth that we're talking about just carrying on from our Q2 results, which showed very strong profitability. Or, very strong revenue coming in the door and then profitability as well, um, just carrying on. Because the last Q2 that we did was only about 11 days worth of purebred under our belt at that point that we were able to report. Ah. So now, we have a, now we have a full quarter that's going to come out hey, associated excellent. with that. So it's very exciting on that side. And then more and more announcements coming that are going to be very exciting for us. So it's, 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 a great, it's a great time for our business and we're very excited for everything that's happening and the momentum that we're carrying. And in terms of your uh, uh, 26,000 coho facility, um, is that planned to be open this year? It is, yeah. Towards the end of this year, we're planning to have that open. And is that, where's that located? In the Lower Mainland? It's right in Richmond. So if you're familiar with the Lower Mainland, yeah. it's right near the, the big Ikea there, the Richmond Auto Mall. So it's right in the middle <laughs> of a, a great yeah. industrial area that's central to the highways and central to a lot of residential. So it's a really amazing space for us to be in for as far as marketability but also as viability too so we're very excited to have that space open uh excellent are there any uh final thoughts that you could leave us with or anything that we didn't touch on that you'd like to touch on well first i appreciate the time like this has been amazing to talk to you i'm a big fan of the talk stocks and really enjoy what you're doing for the public market and people that you believe in and want to see have exposure so grateful for the time today but really just the message out there is that we are now at the point of we're growing this business. There's a lot of good news flow coming. There's strong revenue, there's strong margins, there's gross profit. Everything that we've been talking about is happening and we're now exceeding that. So we want to show that this next year is exciting. The next two years fall are, are very exciting and we will be a brand that is across North America and we'll make sure that Purebed is a household name. There's going to be indulgent bakeries in every neighborhood. And everybody will be able to under, or be part of the story from this point forward. They can be that initial investor that gets that reward down the road from believing in us and believing in the, 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 the marketplace that we're addressing. So very grateful for the shareholders that have believed in us in the beginning, but also looking forward to the shareholders that are joining the ride and enjoying what's going to happen in the next few years. Well, I'm located in the Okanagan, so hopefully you can get a coho open and, and get some purebreds out here. Uh, uh, so that we'll I don't sure have to wait till it's uh, till I'm in the lower mainland or Whistler, but um, we'll, we'll make sure of it. <laughs> but, anyways, I really appreciate your time. We'll certainly be looking to follow up here. Uh, try to do quarterly or you know, at least every Absolutely. six months sort of uh, updates. Um, I'm a shareholder of your company now and looking to sort Thank of you. expand uh, and grow the position. I uh, love what you guys are doing. So, uh, really, um, Amrit, thanks. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for care. Appreciate it too.